Hello everyone and welcome to episode 8 of Soccer 60. Soccer 60 is your youth football podcast where we bring coaches and those in the industry to get to know them more and dissect more about the industry as a whole. Towards the end of the show, as usual, we'll be answering some of your questions. So make sure you send them in through our social media platforms, which is at Little League Soccer MY on both Facebook and Instagram. This week, we have your usual suspects, which is myself, Henry Chu, Andy Johnson, and for today, coach of the FC Kuala Lumpur under trials, Jonathan Abichegger. How are you guys doing today? Very well, thanks, hey Henry. Good, thanks. Right. Yep. Everyone's got a quiet weekend or a good weekend today? Uh, uh, this weekend. Is that this weekend <laughs> just gone or the weekend yes. upcoming, Henry? <laughs> this weekend just gone. <laughs> yeah. I nailed I mean, the intro. <laughs> same old, same old, isn't it? Like, we keep talking mm-hmm. about this every week. The weekends just feel exactly the same as the weekdays. Um, I would say that spending uh yesterday outside went went to a couple of restaurants with with my family i think that people are starting to get back into their everyday life there was a lot of people outside yesterday Um, there was a lot so yeah there was a lot and the restaurants are starting to fill up and and things now so i think you know people are adjusting to the to the sops um of the new normal uh starting to feel like a normal sunday back out again which is nice Uh uh-huh john yeah. Did you go out yeah. this weekend as well? Yeah, I, I went out as well with family. Uh, went to, to my family's place. Went out to a restaurant as well. Uh, like Andy said, I think everything is getting back to normal. Uh, it's just it's hard for me to adjust not going out after ten p.m. But uh, you know <laughs> everything's closed. But uh, I think getting used to it. Yeah. That, All right. that by the way, I love that rule. I hope that rule stays because by ten p.m. <laughs> these days I'm knackered. So I'm good. If, if if there's a reason why I have to go home at ten p.m., I'm all for that. So bring that <laughs> yeah, Alright, uh, before we get cracking A little bit of a housekeeping uh, with Andy Andy, what's up for Little League this week? Yeah, as always uh, Busy week for us um, First up, those those of you that ordered the whiteout jerseys That we put out there a couple of weeks ago They have started being manufactured So um, if you're expecting the delivery of those You can expect that through in the next uh, 10 days to 14 days Um uh, it'd be nice to see them finally produced. It was a long time ago that we we mopped them up. So looking forward to that. Um, obviously, following the announcement by the Prime Minister uh, yesterday, we have started to put plans into place for small group training back out on the field. Um, we're waiting clarity from the Sports Minister later today as to exactly what's going to be allowed. But we've put plans into place to, to launch a, a summer camp um, over the, the school holidays that are upcoming in July and August. Um, So look out for that. We'll be releasing details of that later on this week, again, um, based on what recommendations and SOPs the sports minister releases later today. Uh, We have finally, have we finished the FCKL video montage, Henry? Yes, we have finally finished it. You've written it in your notes, but I'm yet to see it go live online yet. Oh, it's going up. It's going up after this podcast. Don't worry about it. Okay, so by the time that that everybody listens to this uh, podcast and the the video montage that Henry's been working on will be be up and available on our uh, FC Kuala Lumpur Instagram handle. So do look out for that. I'm really excited to see it. Some of the videos that I've seen submitted by our our young players have, have really blown me away. Like it's been phenomenal. So I'm looking forward to seeing the montage of that. Um, also, after this podcast, you'll see up on our Little League website that Coach John is uh, is his turn for his top five tips for training. Um, so look out for that. I um, don't know what it is about yet, but we'll we'll look forward to seeing that. Uh, yep. As always, Coach Nidal continuing our online training sessions uh, with his mini maestro program. My son joined that last week. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, was very happy to win one of the challenges that Nidal had set. So that was great. Um, if you haven't checked it out yet, go, do go and check it out. Um, we'll, we'll be continuing to run those. Even when we, we do get back out onto the pitch, we're probably going to continue that series as well so that those that can't make it to the, to the outside training will be able to continue the online. Uh, and finally, on those online training sessions, we've got a promo for you guys. Um, use the code JUNE50 for 50% discount promo on our website. So if you're interested to find out more about any of those news items, get along to our website, www.littleleague.my, and check it out. And finally, don't forget to rate our podcast. Uh, Henry will give you the details how to do that. If you've got any feedback, please do let Henry know what he can improve on. Um, Much appreciated, (laughs) as always. Henry. Yes. 
Please send in your ratings on your favorite social, uh, your favorite podcasting platforms. I keep mixing this up, but yeah, send it over to us on our your favorite podcasting platforms. Um, rate us five stars. If you have any comments, don't fo- just leave it in the podcasting platform as well, so that we know what to improve on. Um, and that's about it for uh, Little League News with Andy this week. Now we move on to our favorite part of the show, which is explain that kid, John. You told us before that this wasn't really a jersey of choice. <laughs> but I know you have a story behind it. So why don't you tell us why you chose that kit? Obviously, I wanted to find a sentimental jersey. Uh, like maybe my first coaching jersey or a playing jersey that I had. But I realized that I really can't get into any of my old jerseys anymore. <laughs> because they're just too small. Um, yeah. I used to enjoy wearing tight jerseys when I was younger and uh, that would, would have been an XS or a size S but I'm currently an M or L so there's no chance of me getting into that kit. So <laughs> it's basically left me with this one that I'm wearing now. Uh, it still holds some sentimental value though. This was the first uh, FCKL kit uh, that I had that we went for an international tournament. So it's the first tournament that I went for. Um, this is not the coaching kit by the way, this is the supporters kit. Which yep. I've actually, I don't think I've ever worn before. So this is either the first or second time that I've worn this kit. It's uh, it's not the best design kit, but uh, you know, it's a Thanks. lot of sentimental value. Yeah. <laughs> I Sorry, designed which, that which kit, tournament? by the way, John. <laughs> this was a 2018 uh, Borneo Cup. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's what I thought. So that's why I'd like to pull you up on it being the first international tournament you went to. I know you're, you know, you're Malaysian. You should realize that Sabah is part of Malaysia. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't leave yeah, the country, I, John. <laughs> Yeah, I, what I meant by international tournament is basically the the foreign teams that came down to play us, right? Okay. So, yeah. Uh, I have the same kit I, uh, as you did, as you do, because I joined in at the same time, and that was my first international tournament as well. So I share the same I, sentimental I, value. I love that John criticized the design being your first kit design. I think was it Henry? It was my first kit design. Yes. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> um, but I re- I remember that 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 tournament, and I remember it being very early on in your career with us, John. Uh, I think you'd only been with yeah. us for a couple of months or so. I think it was actually the second month. I came in uh, yeah. first week of July, I think, and that was in August. Yep. So it was a very early tournament. So it was a really cool experience How- as well. How, d- how did we end up with you on that tournament in the first two months? <laughs> uh, basically, I took over that age group, so uh, it, was, it was pretty rushed, but uh, it just worked out. And the kids were just back from, summer, from the summer break as well, so um, we adjusted pretty well. And honestly, we should have won the tournament. I think we had a really good tournament. Uh, we were unlucky not to win it, but uh, it was a really good tournament for, for the boys and for myself as well. So, I mean, we don't normally do this at this point in the podcast, but I think it brings up an interesting subject to talk about. So mm-hmm. when you come in like that and you gain a new group of boys for the first time and you immediately have a, a tournament to go and play, like I'm sure a lot of coaches will have been in that situation where they have an upcoming tournament, but probably even uh, more rare to travel to a, to a tournament where you've got to get on a plane and fly with the boys and stay in the hotel and, and, and play that kind of international level competition. How um, was that experience and what challenges that present compared to what uh, your, your previous coaching experience had been up to that point? Um, it, was, it was quite challenging actually because the age group I took, uh, we actually had a mixture of two age groups in there. So we had the under 11s, I believe, but we also had a bunch of 10 year olds as well. So there were actually boys who only trained in me a couple of times before we went for the tournament. Um, it, was, it was a help that I had a couple of assistant coaches as well that worked with the boys before. So that was a bit easier as well. But um, yeah, it, it was a challenge, but I think it was a great opportunity as well because um, it, it it was a lot of team bonding as well. I managed to spend a good amount of time with the boys and we, we developed some good relationships there. And um, fair play, it went really well. It went really well. So I would say the experience was good. It would be a totally different story if you didn't do too well. So I can't really, um, yeah. So it was a good experience though. It was a... Um, it was definitely a challenge, but I think the boys did extremely well, and uh, yeah. And uh, that was just a little bit of an insight of uh, Coach John and his coaching career. But we'd like to know more about that. So why don't you give yourself, give us a little bit of a background on how you got yourself into football? Yeah, I think I got into football just like any other kid would. Um, I would say I wouldn't have come from a, a footballing family. I think my parents both didn't play football. 
So the only the first time I actually heard about football, I started getting an interest into it was the 2002 World Cup. Mm. Uh, for me, that was honestly still the best experience I've ever had in terms of a World Cup because of, I guess it was the timing. I just remember that my my dad had friends coming over to the house nearly every day just watching the games, you know, and that really was like a, really a, a really big experience for me because I never learned anything about football before that. So it was after the World Cup that I think the year after where I went into my first uh, academy as well, just playing some community football and that was basically the start of a dream of mine and uh, uh, it just basically was a huge passion. That was just the biggest passion for me after that. Uh, football never left me. I think um, since since I was seven, all I dreamt about was being a professional footballer. So um, it was it was definitely a big part of my life and still is. So. Um, yeah, from the age of seven all the way to 16 or even 17, my ambition was to become a professional footballer. And basically, that's how I got into coaching. Uh, I managed to play overseas for one or two years and just play some club football here and there. Uh, so yeah, that was how I got into football, really. Uh, you, you, you mentioned uh, playing overseas and that was uh, after our talk uh, in New Zealand with the, um, let me get this right, Nelson Suburbs in the regional leagues. Yep. Is that right? Uh, how was that yep. like? So basically, it, my, at that point, my family were migrating up and down. So I had the chance to go and play for a local club there. I didn't know anything about the club. So actually, a friend of mine recommended I come down. So we went down for I just went down for a training session and played over the weekend. Uh, the club is actually, um, it's I would say New Zealand follows the British system where um, they, fo- they use local clubs, basically. So every town has a town club, you know, and from there, you've got so many age groups and teams from one um, town club, really. And so I joined that team. So Nelson Suburbs was uh, from the city of Nelson. So they were a pretty big club. Uh, they were one of the best teams in the South Island. And uh, they had great facilities. They had a great following as well. I didn't play for the first team. I played for the first year. I played for the under-16s. I think it was a B team. Because I came into the season about the last four games, I think. So I came into the season. Uh, so it was it was a great experience. Never played anything outside of Malaysia before that. So... Um, I realized that I, adapt, I adapted pretty well to the footballing uh, system over there. I think I scored 10 goals in the first three games. <laughs> it was, uh, I wouldn't say it was the highest level initially. Honestly, I don't, I, don't tell to, <laughs> I don't tell this to everyone, but that, that team that I played with actually had girls in there as well. Ah, and I was okay. 16, so that was a really interesting thing to play alongside girls. Uh, and now we know the interest. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, so girls, girls football actually because some some clubs, uh, well, some areas they don't have enough girls to to play in uh, their own uh, certain league. So what they do is they join in with the boys. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that team I played for had about four or five girls playing in there, so wow. it was quite a different experience. Yep. But what uh, did I you just find? A couple of, what What did you yep. find the difference between the the coaching you had received in Malaysia at that point versus the coaching that you received in New Zealand? Honestly, for me, it's a bit of a different uh, scenario because I didn't grow up in a traditional academy in Malaysia. I didn't play for one of the big academies. Uh, I stayed in Puchong, so my access to many of the academies were quite limited. So I basically played for like a, just for a coach for a couple of years in his team. I rarely played any friendly games, as, uh, any games as well in the year, maybe three or four games a year. So my coaching was really only... Uh, so being experienced under this one coach, it was quite limited. So when I went to New Zealand, it just changed everything because the coaching there was very, uh, I would say the coach I had was, uh, he was a senior. He was about 60, 70, but he was, I think, uh, uh, he was a top coach when he was younger as well. So he really nurtured me and really gave me a lot of uh, advice. Um, and at that point, I was a very raw player, actually. I didn't have a lot of the uh, proper development that I needed. So I was a very raw player. I just had a lot of speed and I could finish the ball well, you know. So uh, he really helped nurture me and, and spoke to me about positioning and technique and how that matters and how to play as a team. Because before I went to New Zealand, actually, I was a quite a solo player, actually. I, I rarely passed the ball and I was always up, up front alone. So he helped me play within a team. So that really changed the way I thought about I looked at football. So what is not now... Hold on, Henry. So obviously now uh, you're part of a setup where you are looking to um, give the best possible coaching to young players and, and bring them through the through our academy and, and make them into as good a players as possible. How do you think it would have changed your career path if you had had um, 
the the option to join that kind of program when you were young? Oh, it would have changed. I, w- I would say it would have changed the way I, I, my, I developed tremendously. I feel that the biggest the biggest issue was when I was playing. Um, at that time, there was not many, you, you wouldn't have anything like what we have now. There was no junior league, you know. I think at that point, it was the 1MCC league, and it was just starting up. And that was the only chance you really had of playing. And even then, it was for the older age groups. So it's nothing like what a player in Malaysia gets right now, or a player in the Klang Valley, where they play maybe 30, 40 games a year. I know back then, all we had was an international tournament, maybe once uh, once a year. And then, uh, yeah, there was no leagues and there was just no chance to really develop, you know. The best the best times I had playing was basically playing in my padang or playing in my football field in the evenings. That was the only chance I had of really playing football. So uh, kids these days in Malaysia, they don't understand and they don't realize the opportunity that they have, you know, to be playing within the system that we have at FCKL. It's honestly, if I, I would say this... Uh, if I was playing in this current system, I believe that um, I would have had a much better chance of going professional. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, down. Oh, I thought Andy had something to add on to that. So no, you, uh, you may talk, Henry. <laughs> you may talk. <laughs> uh, now um, we go more into your coaching career. I I wanted to ask this actually before before anything else, but. Um, what made you decide to take the coaching route? And you took it in a very young age as well. So I started playing, uh, sorry, I started coaching when I was 17, actually. Uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, at that point, it was basically, I was in between injuries. So the ultimate goal was still to, to try and get into professional football. But this is when I got back from New Zealand. So when I was back here, uh, my old coach rang me up and said, that's an opportunity to coach. So... Uh, I went and met the academy owner and then I basically just signed on as uh, assistant coach. And uh, yeah, but the ultimate goal was still to go into professional football. I was still young, 17, so I felt up to 21, I still had a chance to try and go for it. Um, so that was still the end goal. But what I found out that was that uh, I started to develop the passion to coach. Uh, the thing is, I started coaching in a really different setup. It was basically toddler football. So it was kids age three years old, to six years old. So I wouldn't even call it coaching. It was more like babysitting sometimes, you know? Because, you know, you can't really coach football. Basically, you're just teaching the really, really basic uh, fundamentals to, to these kids. So um, that was my first experience, really, uh, as, as a grassroots coach, going to baby football, sort of. Uh, yep. And you know, did you do the same route? Yeah. yeah, you know, it's funny. Like, I think that anyone that um, gets into coaching, uh, that's not in, um, you know, the kind of professional clubs. Obviously, if you're going to be in a professional club, you're likely to have come from a professional playing background, and then you transition yeah. into the into the academy of that same club and work your way up through the ranks. As if you're someone that goes through um, football into a private uh, coaching academy, such as this, a private setting, the chances are you're going to start at the very bottom, and that is, yeah. is teaching kids that are three to six years old. We had. Uh, Shaz was on the very first podcast and we told exactly the same sort of story and I think that too many people look at those those age group of kids and kind of dismiss it as football coaching and like John's just said there um, it wasn't really football coaching it was more babysitting but then what he went on to say was very important it was teaching the fundamentals of football well what you have to realize is that's not just teaching those kids fundamentals of football you're also teaching yourself the fundamentals of football coaching you know breaking it down to the very basics I told an analogy way back about being on a first uh, coaching course and and the coach getting us to teach our partner how to tie your shoelaces. It's playing football is something that comes very naturally to you. So to go into football coaching and tell people how to uh, how to play the game can be very difficult. So breaking it down to those really early years and making it extremely fundamental and get back to the basics, I think is so important for, for people, especially if you're coming from a playing background and you've played it to a decent level, certain things come very easy to you and it's very hard to get that message across to somebody who doesn't necessarily find it easy. So it's funny, I think, you know, people often have a lot in common when you start talking to them about how they got into coaching and the vast majority of people I would argue that are coaching in the private kind of world will will be starting at the ages of three, four, five, six years old, Mm. I think Mm. is the best place to start. Yep. And uh, if you don't mind me saying as well, Mm. Go on. Yeah, I was, the, even when you coach, people don't realize, but when you do coach at such a young age group, when you coach at such a young age group, um, 
it basically just reminds you of the passion about football as well. You know, it's basically at that age group, you're teaching a kid the love of the game, mm. you know. And I've, I have some friends of mine that went straight into coaching, but they went straight to men's football. And it was all about the tactical side. It was all about the intensity, you know, and they burnt out really quickly, you know, because right. I felt that the most important part of their coaching was, you know, is to impart knowledge. And that wasn't the case with them, you know, and this, that's a huge part of, fo- of uh, football is when you get to, to uh, coach these young kids and basically show them how to love the game, basically, you know. Uh, and, yeah. and, and you, brought, you brought up a very good point as well, which was going to lead to my next question, which is, about adapting to different age groups for you as a young coach. Um, especially the older age groups who are probably, at that point of time, if you started coaching that, uh, them, uh, it would be about your peer age, right? How did they see you? Did they see you as like another friend or did they see you as Coach John? Yeah, I think I've had the chance to coach basically almost all the age groups, I think from all the ways from three years old up to men's football, I've managed to, so I've had the opportunity to coach all the age groups. And like you said, the ones, the senior level, uh, I started coaching all the age groups when, maybe when I was about 19 or mm. 20. So mm. at that point, I took an under-16 team. And then when I was 23, I took an under-21 team. Uh, even when I was 22, I was assistant coach to a men's team. So um, yeah, I think the biggest part for me, it was a challenge because um, uh, you have to find that balance beti- between being firm with your with your players and also being friendly, you know. And um, I, w- I would say that the most important thing for me was that I tried to establish was respect. I don't know that whether that was me personally, but, uh, you know, especially when you take a group of 16-year-olds where they believe that they know everything about football already, you know, and you're o- if you're only a couple of years older, it's very difficult if you start saying the wrong things to them. Mm. So from the very start, I had to make sure that whatever I said, the way I communicated was always um, as professional as I could. And in that way, the players saw me as someone who took it seriously and it was just not, I was just not messing about. And mm. so that sort of gave me a bit of credit when I spoke to them and did listen, you know? It's basically practice what you preach, right? If you start yep. saying certain things, but you don't practice it yourself, uh, these players are not dumb. They're going to see that. They're going to catch it. And then they're just going to, you know, your respect and your influence over them uh, diminishes, really. Mm. Andy, what about you? Did you share the same experience as John has? Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, I, I shared the story before. When I first started coaching, I ended up coaching a men's team straight away. I was, yep. I was like 17, 18 years old. And I was... I was actually coaching a team that was in an over thirties league, so I was mm. I was literally coaching people twice my age, uh, mm. which was which was very bizarre. But I think that people tend to get into coaching for two reasons: either you are an exceptionally talented player and you know you feel you should be able to coach, or you weren't that great a player but you used to think about the game a lot. And I would say that I was much more on that scale of things. I, I wasn't a fantastic player, um, but I used to play the game like observing it and and seeing where there was areas to exploit and things like that and i think if you're that kind of minded it it doesn't really matter who you're teaching as long as you know what you're seeing and you can impact it and people will look at you strange you know if you're the same age or perhaps even younger than the people you're coaching it will Hmm. definitely seem strange but at the end of the day they will listen to the first thing that comes out of your mouth because you're stood there as the coach now if the first thing that comes out of your mouth makes no sense you've lost it right because right it's, it's 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 much quicker it's much quicker for them to lose that that faith in you if you're younger than them but if the first thing that comes out of your mouth makes sense then you can start to get the buy-in from them and i think mm. this is where yeah. people that go into coaching from just being an extremely talented player it's harder for them to make that that transition into teaching people that are older than them because again it goes back to that story that i was telling if you're really talented and things come naturally to you it might be more difficult for you to point out um, the areas in the game that other people can exploit so i think it Mm. depends a little bit on the individual and i would say that if you were a very talented player and getting into coaching um, because you're a talented player uh, go and start right at the basics and you shouldn't shouldn't go ahead you know before that whereas if you're somebody that's always been a tactical player always been thinking about the game always been like analyzing your performances or performances of your teammates you probably have a bit of a better opportunity to start a little bit higher up now 
Not yep. to say that I think you should. I, I think you should always start at the bottom and work up. But mm. yep. it's it's gonna it's gonna help you if you if you do end up in that situation where you're you're with players of similar age. If you're somebody that's always yep. been talking about the game, much in the same way, like if you've been the captain of a team and you're you know you're you're pipping in with team talks at half time or at full time, you give a bit of an analysis. You might do that as captain anyway. If you mm-hmm. do that as, as a captain amongst your peers, then chances are when you go into coaching, you're going to get the respect of whichever group you're, yeah. you're taking. Yeah, right. Definitely. Uh, then, then we move on to the misconceptions. I'm, I'm very sure that when you were a young, uh, as a young coach, there must be some, you know, some glares that you guys will get. What are the misconceptions of uh, coaching at a young age and how would you guys debunk it? John, why don't you start first? I think... Uh, one that really got to me was when I went for my C license. I think I was 21 at the time. And basically, it was the first or second day. The instructor called me up, asked me to stand up, and he asked me in front of the whole class, how old am I? And then I stood up and said, I'm 21. And then he just said in front of everyone, uh, you shouldn't be coaching football. You should still be playing. You know? He was like, he made it very clear. He was trying to just put me down. That was his mentality. He was like, you shouldn't be coaching football. You should be playing. What do you have to offer? You have no experience off the game and uh, at that point I couldn't really answer him because you know he's an instructor and I, I was a bit of a shell shocked but uh, yeah I, I realized the misconception when going uh, as I was coaching was always the no experience not played professionally or maybe the communic- the communication side of it you know can you control your team you know how you deal with parents there's always a conception where misconception that uh, you know basically you're not mature enough in that situation right uh, Andy, uh, yeah, I've, I've seen it firsthand. Uh, I've experienced it myself. You know, I, I think that when when you're young, uh, there's no way to get away from the fact that you're inexperienced, right? Doesn't doesn't yeah. matter what you do, you're an inexperienced coach. And when you make a mistake, as all coaches do, um, the parents or the players, whoever you know, whatever situation you're in they will jump on that mistake a lot quicker if you are younger. Yeah. You know, if you're yeah. someone yeah. that's older and more experienced, they're far more likely to forgive you. Um, I think yep. it's just human nature. Uh, and I think yep. it's just something that you need to be aware of as a young coach. And mm. I think yep. you should use it to keep yourself on your toes. Uh, you are going to be judged. There's very little you can do to, to stop that and, and prevent it. Um, and I think... This is something I think John's been caught in before. Is like when he makes a mistake, uh, hold your hands yeah. up and admit it. You know, and yeah. when you do yeah, that, people sure. pe- people tend to be a bit more understanding. You know, like if someone wants yeah. to have a go at you and you know you've made a mistake, it's far better to go, "Yeah, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. Uh, I'll learn from this and and won't let it happen again." If you do that, people are generally yeah. understanding. Uh, you kind of stop it in its tracks, uh, and people yeah. will appreciate that you're young and you're mature enough to accept that. It's when yep. you make a mistake and you don't necessarily admit it, you, you, you try to save yourself and, and you start to spiral a little bit. People will then yeah. see you're a young, experienced coach and you're not mature enough to admit it. So yep. uh, you can't get away from experience in, in coaching, right? Mm. There's no substitute for it. It doesn't matter whether you've got five years of experience, there's someone out there with 10 years of experience who knows yeah. better than you. And there's somebody out there sure. with 20 years of experience. So, you, you know, you always have to be aware of these things. And I think it's just use it to fuel your your passion in the right way. Mm. So okay. Um, then brings me to my next question. Uh, this is a term that when I was doing some research on um, what are the misconceptions of coaching at a young age, this word came out. Uh, this term came out and the term is age is a barom- barometer for experience is that now true or false for both of you why don't angie go first i think it's completely true um but you have to take it as it's meant to to imply is that you know you can't cheat experience right um experience is experience but you also have to take into consideration that age is not the only indication of experience Right, somebody yeah. that gets in gets into coaching like John when he was seventeen years old. By the time he's twenty-seven, he's been coaching for ten years. That's ten years of relevant yeah. experience. 
Now, yep. let's say yep. someone gets into coaching at 30 after they've retired from a game of, uh, from playing professionally and they, and someone at 32 says, oh, they're 32 years old, they must be very experienced, but they've only had two years of coaching uh, experience, then it's, it doesn't quite always ring true. But mm. it is an indication. I do think so. I, I don't think it's a completely unwarranted statement. You know, there's this stuff that you come into coaching that uh, you will only learn after coaching for five, six, seven, however many years it may be. Um, but you have to take that age statement with a little bit of a pinch of salt because you never know yeah. what people's backgrounds are. Uh, John, do you share the same sentiments or do you have something different to say about it? I think what Andy said is true as well. Is like age. It's basically the years you've been coaching as well, right? But it also depends on what you do with that age, what you've done in those years of coaching. You know, uh, honestly, I've grown in the last two years compared to the previous four years of my coaching. Just the way that uh, I, I looked at it, you know, it's like how you learn from these experiences. And obviously, the more types of experiences you have, the more you can develop and the more you can adapt and learn as a coach. Mm. Um, if you're just coaching a weekend team for six years, you know, once or twice a week. It's very different than coaching uh, full-time for uh, six months, you know. You probably will get more sessions out of those six months than six years of just coaching once or twice a week. So it just, mm. you can't really even put it, cap it down to years, but basically what you do in those years and how you also learn from your mistakes and those experiences, really. Um, one thing I realized as a young coach is um, the only way that I can grow as quick as I can is, is to really just learn from all my experiences, whether it's good or bad, you know. Mm. always uh, look on the bright side of things and always, always I always tell myself you know I always self-reflect what could I have done better and what did I learn out of this situation so I think that's really important uh, as a young coach if you want to really mature and improve now uh, mm, I, think, I think as well just, just to jump on that um, and I hope John doesn't mind me sharing this but uh, yeah. I think there's been a, a drastic um, uh, 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 development in John's coaching over the last year or so and mm -hmm. you know when John first started coaching with us he he was um, doing a lot of work outside of the coaching he was doing with us and he had various different yeah. um, projects that were on the go and and other yeah. um, you know jobs that he was trying trying to run and stuff like that mm -hmm. and probably a year ago he was making more money than he is now but to his credit yeah. he decided to take a pay cut and focus 100% yeah. of his time and effort on what he's doing with us here at FCKL. And I think that that, yeah. as he's recognized himself, has resulted in dramatic improvements and development in his, in his coaching ability and levels. And I think that yeah. goes to show just what he was talking about there, how like it depends what you dedicate yourself to. You know, Just yes. because you've been yeah. in it for so many years, uh, doesn't mean you're necessarily dedicating your 100% effort to it. And I think mm. what John yeah. did, is very commendable and not everybody would would decide to do that but yeah. i think it will reap better rewards for him in the future um, yeah. as a result so i, I think it's that that's hugely commendable and he deserves a lot of credit for that and i think that yeah. um, like i said it will pay off in the long run um and that's a, a story that i hope he shares with other young coaches that he sees come through that yeah. are highly ambitious highly driven highly motivated try not to do too much at once uh, yeah you want to yeah. like focus your your concentration a little bit i feel yeah yeah uh speaking of commendations and in the long run as well i like i like where this is taking us as well but uh, we have to cut this short to go on to the next topic before we end this um one thing to commend to john unofficially john at age 23 was the yeah. youngest in southeast asia to receive the afc b license um that yeah. being said I want to know what's next for you, John. Are you planning to do another license or are, what, what is it? What's next in the long run? Yeah, obviously, the gen, uh, my aim is to go and get my A license. And after that, we'll see where that takes me. But uh, yeah, I think uh, I'm not sure whether it's official. I remember the instructor just bringing it up to me because I know that the youngest A license coach right now in Asia was, I think, 28 or 27. So I could have actually, I had the chance to apply for my A license this year at 25. So, but uh, I missed out on the opportunity. Uh, we'll see what happens next year, but that definitely is something that I want to work towards. You know, I think, uh, yeah, it's something that I definitely want to achieve and uh, just try and get my A license as early as I can. But not, not just because of the certificate, but basically when I did go for my B license, the knowledge that I learned from that course 
uh, was just tremendous. Like um, mm. it just changed the way I coached and just changed the way I looked at football. And I believe that uh, since then, it's really taken me on a path of just developing myself to be the best that I can be. And right. I can't wait to see what the A license has, uh, you know? So, yeah. Here's to looking forward to that as well. And now we move on to the next topic of the episode. Now, we've, we've explored this topic on our very first episode uh, of Soccer 60. And I thought with the Prime Minister's announcement on Sunday, this would be a good time to bring it back again. So, this week, we're going to talk about the new normal post MCO um, which is the movement control order uh, the Prime Minister just announced the recovery movement control order which means that a lot of things are starting to come back to normal again uh, but there's a lot of uh, standard operating procedures happening as well that being said let's just go into football um, with normalcy coming back again uh, Andy as the managing director of a football academy how has the pandemic been for you like could you share your reflections on this last two months or three months Probably shouldn't give you the immediate words that come to mind because um, mm. you might have to do a lot of edit. Might have to do a lot of editing. I kind of know um, what you're going there. <laughs> you know, it's it's been uh, pretty shocking. You know, um, I, I never for, um, foresaw that in the year 2020 we might have a situation where for four months we can't train football outside. You know, um, as a yeah. as a business owner, you look at. Um, you know the businesses that you operate and and you try to th think and and predict problems that might arise in the future so that you can be prepared for them of all the things that I, I have ever prepared for uh, this was never on the horizon you know I never thought a virus a global pandemic would would shut us down for for four months and um, yeah it's been difficult but the the one thing I'd say is it's, it's, it's been good that's happened in the year 2020 where online training has become so viable. You know, right. if this had happened yeah. two or three years ago, um, we would have been completely shut down for the last three months. We wouldn't have been able to do anything. And it's, it just makes you appreciative of, of things that, that transpire with technology, the innovations that come about day to day. Um, and for me, like, you know, I've been through various different forms of um, feelings throughout this but at some point i certainly accepted what the situation was and look mm. forward actually to the end of it and and other business opportunities that this can open up like online training is now a very viable platform right and this yep. potentially gives us the um reach to to get outside of kl and teach kids that that can't come to our training venues that that have problems with transport um, and you can do it at a, a fraction of the cost of, of training outside on a yeah. pitch. Um, mm -hmm. And then you start to talk about the, the amount of hours that get saved in terms of travel, uh, you know, the, the amount of coaching that coaches can get in, you know, previously restricted to after school hours. Well, mm. are people going to start to be able to conduct lunchtime classes during school breaks and, and the like? like there's, there's really like a lot of things that you can think about, like, you know, a, a preschool football session before you go off to school in the morning. Why can't we do that now? Like there's 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 like limitless possibilities of what can now be achieved through this uh, through this online training. And for me, that's really exciting. Um, and I think that the other thing that comes out of it is is what I'd like John to talk about now is about how it changes the coaches mindsets and mm. what they have been able to extract from their players during this time and what kind of uh, developments in, in their kids they're going to see when they do get back out onto the pitch because yep. whilst we've been doing online training for three months, it's been working on a vastly different set of skills to what would normally be done in a training session. So I find mm. it fascinating from that point of view as well. So John, what about you? As a coach's perspective, how has, how has the pandemic been for you? I think uh, we've had enough time to adapt and quickly change the way we coach. I think that was the only way we could have gone forward. I think if we stuck to the way our old methods, I think uh, we, wouldn't have, we wouldn't have had a chance to train basically in the last couple of months. But uh, we've managed to do our Zoom sessions and the boys have been, uh, at, at least for my boys, they've been really committed and really uh, and, uh, really happy to be doing the training, at least some sort of training. Obviously, it can never compare to it training on the pitch but 
uh, in this season, the, my boys have learned uh, a lot of things, based, especially on the ball mastery and and skill side. You know, my boys have been able to really dedicate their training and really develop their their techniques with the ball, and that's really been um, uh, uh, that's really encouraged me as well in my coaching to see that. Uh, our boys are still committed and and they still love football, you know. And they, some boys I know were training maybe two three hours a day, just to learn something which they didn't have the chance to before. You know, last time they could, uh, they only had three training sessions a week and that's all they do. But now my boys have now actually realized that they can actually train at home, and mm. hopefully going forward this is going to be uh, a game changer for us where. Uh, my players would go back and actually continue the training instead of yep. just coming to the pitch once or twice a week, you know? So mm. in that in that sense, uh, I'm seeing my boys able to develop their own self-discipline and seeing themselves develop uh, um, basically, yeah, the ability to just train at home. So that really helps them. I mean, I think that's, I think that's such a great point because how often do we hear of the the stories of all the great football players um you know that have ever been and how they talk about you know it's it's not necessarily the hours you put in on the team training sessions it's about the the hours that you stay behind afterwards the hours you do before that and you do those all by yourself right and mm, yeah you know we we are probably um uh dealing with uh, and and teaching kids in our program that have never done that before you know, yep. They've never done yeah. uh, workouts at home. They've never gone home and practiced their their juggling or, or whatever. Or maybe a, yep. a, a very small minority of our academy has. But for the yep. last three months, everybody has been doing that. It's been the only mm. way to train. Yep. And I would imagine that there's a lot of kids in our program now that have kind of got into that habit of training at home. And when we do yep. get back out yep. onto the pitch, they are going to continue to do that. Like instead of coming home from school, running upstairs and, and sitting on their, their PlayStation or whatever it may be. I, I dare say there's going to be a lot of kids that come home and now get their football out because they, yep. they know they, they've got a few drills that they could practice or, you know, they've, they've got, you get into a habit, right? When these kids have been training yep. three, four, five times a week with their coach online, you get into a habit of training at home. And I think that that's, we could potentially see really huge improvements as a result of that. Hmm. But John, another thing yep. I was going to ask you was what, what do you think, um, from the side of the camaraderie and team chemistry, have you noticed anything interesting about that? Um, it's. I think it depends on the age group as well, um, because obviously the younger age groups they have less access to the internet and to to communicate with each other. I believe with the older age groups, it's it, it's it's a lot easier. You know, they they talk to each other all the time. They they are friends not only in football but outside football. In terms of my under-12 uh, team, where maybe only a quarter of my boys actually have their own handphones and stuff like that, they only get to see each other on the Zoom sessions. Um, what I usually do is, after my Zoom session, I would actually leave the chat open for maybe 5-10 minutes and just let the boys have a conversation amongst themselves. Um, I've also put in a lot of challenges in my Zoom workouts, like a lot of quizzes in between workouts, you know, and stuff like I would put out a, a squad number and the first player that can type whose number that belongs to, uh, you know, stuff like that. So basically now they understand, they're learning more about them te their teammates as well. And yeah, I, I asked yeah. the question because when we first, like we, we did about two weeks uh, when the MCO kicked in of um, sending drills home to players to practice and they practice on their own and stuff before we got started with the live classes online, right? And obviously yep. that meant that there was two week period where the kids hadn't seen each other at football training, which when you think yep. about like normally they would see each other, depending on how old they are, three, four, maybe even five times a week with the match at the weekend. Yep. Um, yep. And I think that that was, I don't think kids realized how much they uh, cling to that as a social activity. Because when I logged yep. into the first few online Zoom classes, you, you saw immediately the smile on kids' faces to see their teammates there and that they were they yep. were going to be able to do something together. And although they weren't there physically yep. in person, I think that kids underestimate that a lot. And I think mm. it just goes yep. to show how strong that team bond is between sports people. I mean, we speak about it yep. a lot, but until yeah. you're separated like that, I don't think you necessarily see it. And I would imagine that when we do get back to training, like when we when we get back out, hopefully in the next few days, it's going to be by no means the same as it was before. It's going to be very much broken up and still separated. But when they start to get back together to train as a team, whenever that may be, 
um, I think it's going to be something that they they value a bit more. Yeah, and yeah, whether sure. They, whether sure. they whether they acknowledge that, you know, obviously the younger ages are going to be unable to to truly acknowledge that, but. Yeah. I think they will certainly appreciate it more going forward. And again, I hope that it results in a even tighter team bond and better performance on the football pitch. Yep. Yeah, uh, that's for sure. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave uh, a little bit of a personal anecdote here as well. But what I've realized is that from from listening to you two is that we need to, we, we have learned to appreciate time a lot more. Uh, we, yeah. I, I, think, I think now with the online Zoom sessions and also the time that you have in the lockdown you would then realize that actually you have time to do things like extra training sessions even though it's just setting aside half an hour an extra half an hour a day um, and also in terms of team chemistry uh, people would start and players would start to value uh, their teammates more because you never know when yeah. things like this would happen again uh, and you not be able to see each other on the field but with 2020 in mind, you will have so many alternatives to kind of keep the team bond as well. On the field, this would definitely reflect on um, when you have teams who do not have access to online coaching, and when you have teams that have access on to online coaching, you would see. A, I would I would believe that there will be a huge difference in terms of how they would treat each other on the field. Now, back th- that being said, um, do you think? Do you, John? Do you think your players are ready to see the football football field again? Do you think Do you think um, they're ready to go and play again? Obviously, everyone misses it. So definitely, uh, if the chance comes, everyone's going to be back on the pitch. Mm. Um, they would be missing some fundamentals, like maybe fitness, and and they they would be a bit rusty. But you know, give it one or two days or a couple of sessions, and they'll be back to it completely. Mm. Uh, yes, my players are ready. I think everyone wants to be back on the pitch as soon as they can. So I think it's just that we have to figure out within the SOPs and and once it's regulated by the government when we can come back and how we're going to do that. You know. Mm. But yeah, uh, answer your question. We can't wait to be back on the pitch. That's for sure. Have Have you both? Um, okay. So what do you What do you guys think the new normal for football is? Um, I think we've had. Like examples with the Bundesliga back, we saw how they are treating it, how they're handling it. The Premier League has five substitutes um, starting this week. Um, but what do you think is the new normal for grassroots football? Andy, why don't you start first? Well, look, grassroots football is very different to professional football. Um, mm-hmm. I, yep. I think that, that that has to be noted. And obviously, we are not in a position to be able to, to test players and uh, take the, the necessary precautions. I think like it's going to be a long time before we see large scale tournaments or leagues get back to, to how they were. Yeah. Um, mm. uh, I, I can't, I can't see competitive matches being organized really anytime soon. Um, it's yeah. going to, it's going to, I think it's still probably six months away before we play competitive matches. And then I think right. when we do get them, they're going to be introduced back so that it will be only those two teams that will be allowed to be, anywhere in the vicinity you know normally we would play yeah. if you're playing a seven aside match for under eights for example you would normally have four pitches set up over the the, the full size 11 aside pitch i don't yeah. think that's going to happen for a long time i think mm. it will be you know one, one game per per big space per big field whatever it may be so that's obviously going to um, disrupt the scheduling of organizers yep. and how many games yep. can be played yeah um you know it's it's going to affect a lot. It's going to affect a lot. And I think that my personal view on it is that that training can get back to normal relatively quickly because all of the coaches are able to design training programs with which avoids contact, bodily contact. Like I, I totally understand the need to avoid body contact at the moment, but I don't think it should, should take away from the kids being able to train. Um, mm. There's many ways that we can, can work that uh, in and still run drills and patterns and, and, and patterns of play uh, where body contact is not necessary um, that will help a lot like we're looking to resume training um, with four kids on a half pitch no contact between them not even the exchanging of footballs to start off with um, slowly that's going to ramp up to those four kids can then interact a little bit they can pass footballs to each other they can run overlapping runs and things like this yeah uh, 
then that, that's going to increase the the number of kids that can then be allowed in that certain area. Maybe it goes to eight, maybe it goes to 10, who knows? Um, and then slowly you're going to get back to, you know, having a full squad. Like for the younger teams that play seven aside, you're talking about 15 kids being on a pitch. That mm. should be relatively achievable fairly soon, I, I would like to think, um, as long as, again, it's designed without physical contact. But the image of getting kids back playing competitive games or even training games amongst themselves at training um that's a harder concept for me to get into my head as to when that might be allowed yeah. at the moment mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. john what about you yeah. what is your new normal what is the new normal for football i think it's basically uh, just repeating what andy said like i think the times when you're going to see like football carnivals or international tournaments I think that's going to be quite some time from now. I think uh, in the meantime, we just want to be focused on getting back on the pitch first. Um, obviously, the clubs and the teams that have their private facilities, they would be better equipped to control that. So I believe that FC Care, the Little League, we, got, we are in a good position. Uh, so, uh, so we would definitely have an edge uh, when we come back to training. But even then, also, it just depends on what the government puts out, right? Uh, yep. How, how they're going to regulate it and how they're going to enforce it, really. Mm. Um, it's, been, it's been pretty tough this last couple of months because there's not been any clarity from anyone, really. So hopefully uh, that improves over the next couple of days or weeks. But yeah, um, it's going to be... Yeah, go ahead, Andy. Yeah, I think like if you, if you look at um, the general rules of training, the general rule of thumb is that you lose uh, gains twice as quick as you, as you gain them, right? Um, be it strength or fitness or, you know, whatever it may be. So, you know, our kids have now effectively been out of training for, for three months. Um, yep. Realistically, yep. for them to get back to the same point that they are at, you're talking five to six months, right? So yep. the goal yep. for me is to get back training so that these kids can have time to get back their conditioning and, and their ball work and, and all sorts of stuff that they will have lost over the last three months and then be ready yep. to go at the end of the year. But I think that... Um, training should be able to get back to relatively normal quite quickly in my opinion like it's very easy mm. to design yep. training programs that avoid any unnecessary risks um, right i think that's yep. what you've seen with the pro clubs they've been able to revert to training relatively quickly um yep. and yep. then the matches obviously have to be held behind closed doors and and, and things like that um, but it's getting back to training is very important because it's very very quick that you lose your your fitness and and conditioning so it's really important to get back to training especially for kids right and yeah um, I, I would like to see that be able to return to normal relatively quickly but I fully understand about the competitive matches taking a bit longer to get back to yeah yeah um, that's for sure before we, we we move on to our final segment do you guys have anything new that you want to implement once you guys are back on the field coaching again why don't you John why don't you give us your ideas or at things that you might want to see new on the pitch first before Andy gives his piece. I think um, the Zoom training has been honestly really helpful and that will be something I would like to continue if I have the chance to. Um, obviously, we're quite limited that uh, we only have a couple of sessions a week with the players, but with the Zoom training now, that allows us to focus on other things that we don't necessarily need to be doing on the field. So stuff like physical work, maybe uh, even tactical work, uh, match reviews, or even... Um, yeah, even watching yeah watching our match analysis and stuff like that, we can be doing those online now. So that's going to free up our training times, and that's de definitely going to give us a chance to focus more uh, on the training and and stuff we can do on the field. So that's going to be something useful going forward. Uh, yeah, that's all I can put in for now. Andy, for for me, uh, it's quite a simple one to think of. Actually, the first thing that sprung to mind for me was was when kids first turn up, waiting for their training to start. You know, it's it's uh, inevitable when kids turn up on a football pitch, the first thing they want to do is grab a ball and kick it in the goal. Um, yeah. Now, our, our coaches work pretty hard on uh, on giving them different drills to turn up. I know some coaches set up like basic passing drills. So when they come in, they arrive there, they start in with their passing with their teammates. But after three months of this online Zoom training, they are going to be armed to the gills of individual uh, ball mastery work that they can work on. And coming yep. into to a training session, if they arrive 10, 15 minutes early, I'd like to see them get into the habit of implementing those things that they've been doing online for so long. You know, just just take your ball, 
do whatever pool mastery exercises you've been shown by your coaches over the last three months kill the time that way you get in your 10 15 minutes of, of close ball, ball uh, control and lots of touches of it and that's going to set you up for the training yeah. much better than just smashing the ball yeah the goal. yeah that is true that is very true and that means coach Kurt doesn't have to go and uh, nick balls away from players after this when when he comes back <laughs> <laughs> um honestly it's very optimistic things are getting a lot better now um, but we'll wait and see what happens with the football industry we still are quite in the dark about it but looking forward to see the light at the end of the tunnel of course we move on to the final segment of the show where we take um, questions to Andy and John for, for them to answer um, that segment is called Soccer 60 I can't believe I forgot my favourite soccer segment Soccer 60 segment but uh, here is the part where I just explained to you guys before and let's just crack cracking uh, we have um, questions from social media now so don't forget to send us your questions on Facebook and Instagram at Little League Soccer MY. Um, don't email us uh, because um, I don't know how you get my email. <laughs> so I'm the only one handling it right now. But uh, let's go on to the very first one. Uh, do you have a question from your player, John? Uh, Idris Dibala. Idris. Um, okay. Uh, what was your ambition when you were younger? I think, I think he, he meant to put it in a sense that Maybe if you didn't think about football, what would you have become? Well, I think in me it was always just football, really. Um, I think the only thing I saw was football that I could really be doing with my life. So I never really entertained the idea of doing anything else. And I was glad that my parents supported me in that way. Uh, but yeah, it was always something within football. So that's all I can say, really. Andy, what about you? Why don't why don't you share with us your ambition when you were growing up? Um, I honestly could never say that I had an ambition to play uh, football. Um, mm. It was it was interesting to me. I enjoyed it. I very much loved it. It was a big part of my my childhood growing up. But as were other sports, football was not the only sport I played. Yep. Um, all I know that I wanted to do is I wanted to finish university and I did not want to sit behind a desk Monday to Friday. To <laughs> okay, that was something okay. I said over and over again. And um, I always anticipated that I would end end up sitting behind a desk. But for the, for the first few years of my career, I was adamant I wanted to do something not office-based. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's, I, I mean, I fell into coaching more than anything, really. And I was given the opportunity to do so and it kind of developed into what it has. I wouldn't say that I planned it out that way. Um, but I, I just knew I was adamant I didn't want to go and sit in an office from Monday to Friday, nine to five. And even now, like I spend a lot of time behind my desk, obviously, and I have to, but I could never sit in the office Monday to Friday, nine to five. I could never do that. Um, yeah. A lot, lot of respect to people that do that. It's not for me. Um, I, I, I try to make my time when I go into the office as, as efficient as possible and I try not to mm. to, to be in there unnecessarily yeah. so I try yep. to, to, to plan my uh, my work as such that I go in there I get the task done that I need and then I then I go out again so um, yeah I just I just didn't want to sit behind a desk <laughs> so that was uh, Andy's ambition not to sit behind the desk um, yeah. I wrote for us uh-huh Yes, I, I, I can see that. Uh, Iro Firas um, asked you a question. Uh, can you suggest a simple diet for you footballers? Oof. After, <laughs> after he said he can't fit into any of his shirts anymore. <laughs> exactly. I thought that was really appropriate to bring it back up again. That was a good question, Firas. I would say, I would say I'm still one of the fittest FCKL coaches. One of them. Uh, Eden is obviously the fittest one. But... Uh, yeah, the, the, thing with, the thing with nutrition is uh, actually you can give advice, uh, but uh, it's actually against the law to actually draw out a plan for people if you're not a certified nutritionist. Uh, yeah. What I can tell just off the board is just avoid the junk food. Uh, avoid the junk food. You know, it, it, the diets just depend on, on every everybody's body is different, right? So mm -hmm. uh, you can't set out one plan. Everyone can follow the same thing. Basically, the general rule is maybe just avoid all the junk food you know try and eat as healthy as you can um have your have your sources of protein have your sources of carbs and your fibers as well um just a healthy balanced diet and obviously one thing that a lot of people forget is you need to hydrate a lot 
for us in Malaysia for young players as well in the kind of weather that we have hydration is so important and players mm. don't really realize that uh, when we don't hydrate ourselves enough our body can't function to its best so um, besides just nutrition you've got to make sure that you're always hydrating and drinking a lot of water mm-hmm. so, yeah all right about Andy. <laughs> Andy, do you want to put in your uh, input as well well yeah look I'm certainly no dietitian uh, love a good ice cream can't help that <laughs> Um, but for me, it's it's just moderation, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I, I think it's, it's very bad for anybody, but especially kids, to be limiting uh, stuff that they don't want to eat. Um, mm. Yeah. You know, to, to say, like, I'm not going to eat this or, or don't eat that, I think that's really bad. Uh, but yeah. you, should, you should be um, self-aware enough to realize when you're eating too much of, of one thing. Everybody knows really what the bad foods are. You know, like John said, they're yeah. junk food. That's the easiest category to put it in. You, everyone knows whether they're eating too much junk food. And if you think mm. you're eating too much junk food, you're eating too much junk food. So <laughs> just, yep. just you know, yep. don't 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 ban yourself from eating anything, but just just keep control of how limit, much you're yeah. eating. Yeah, you're right. Final question is from our very good coach friend Simon Motika, oh. and this is definitely to uh, John. His question is. How is it like living with a Scotsman? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, uh, wow. So obviously you guys know I stay with uh, Coach Kurt and Coach yep. Vishnu as well. So uh, honestly, uh, living with a Scotsman, uh, it can be a bit crazy and intimidating <laughs> sometimes. But, uh, you know, uh, yeah, but that's what Hold I'll on. say. You know? you just Hold on, be- Intim- intimidating. Intimidating. What what has what is the story uh, behind? I'm not going to I'm not going to say too much because uh, mm-hmm. this is uh, this is a family ch- a family podcast, so you know. Okay. But uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's fun. Honestly, I would say it's fun. Uh, it's great to stay with other people, other cultures. You know. Uh, so yeah, I enjoy it. Uh, definitely do miss Kurt. I can't wait for him to be back. So yeah. And did you have any news on whether uh, how how things are? <laughs> Don't ask me, man. <laughs> well, we 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 are going to leave uh, Coach Kurt on a little bit of uncertainty here, but we hope that uh, he enjoys this last question dedicated to him on this podcast. Uh, but that is the end of Soccer Sixty Episode Eight. Um, it was a very optimistic end to it. Uh, right, like how that's why I really personally enjoyed this episode, uh, amongst with the other seven episodes that I've done before. But thank you so much, John, for joining us today. Uh, Yep. Don't forget to give us feedback. Send us some of your questions. Uh, we'd love to hear from you guys. Subscribe to your to us on your favorite podcasting platforms. Nailed it. Um, and uh, don't forget to follow us on our social media platforms as well. At social. Uh, oh no, I didn't nail this one. But let's try it again. Um, don't forget to follow us on our Little League Soccer social media platforms at Little League Soccer MY on Facebook, Instagram. Stay tuned next week where we speak to Mark Hughes. Until next time, this has been Soccer Sixty. See you guys next week.